Welcome back, disciples of Olympus and students of other cult practices. In our last lecture, we looked at the Greek god Zeus, beginning with the Theogony of Hesiod, and proceeded to the thousand faces of Zeus on the ground, from house to city-state, temple to oracular sanctuary. We even visited briefly the temple of Jupiter's Zeus's alter ego in Rome. Zeus, of course, was not alone. He had companions on Olympus. Hera, his sister and wife, Hermes, messenger, liar, and thief, Apollo, god of medicine and light, Artemis, a hunter and wild goddess of the moon, Athena, severe in beauty and wisdom, Hephaestus, metal worker and handyman, Ares, undiplomatic and bellicose, Aphrodite, goddess of lust and bestower of beauty, Poseidon, god of horses, earthquakes, and the sea. Demeter, goddess of grain and mother goddess par excellence. Hestia, goddess of the family hearth. Yes, her Roman counterpart, Vesta, is more famous. Other gods found their way to Olympus too. Dionysus, although conceived in a mortal woman's womb, was born into immortality from his father's thigh. It's complicated. Heracles, born human, won a spot through the glory of his deeds. Ganymede, the cupbearer with his boyish and naked charms, caught the eye of Zeus, sexual predator in the sky. Suffice it to say that Olympus was well populated, and the myths that describe these deities remain relatively well known to this day. But these are not the gods who dominated the daily life of the family, and thus the daily life of the average ancient Athenian about whose lives we are better informed than we are about the lives of ancient Greeks in other cities, although religious life would have been similar elsewhere, as inscriptions and literary accounts amply attest. Let us abandon the rarefied airs of Olympus for the smoky hearths of a home belonging to a free-born Athenian citizen, that is, a male head of household, the one who was allowed to participate in public life inherit and own property, including property that consisted of fellow human beings. Slaves were reckoned valuable property indeed. Such men did not represent the majority of the population, which, in addition to male citizens and their slaves, included, of course, women and children, but also resident aliens whose rights were defined rights, but who generally possessed no path to citizenship. Athens was a popular destination, so there was also usually a sizable contingent of foreign visitors. Slaves, children, and women appear in the home, so we will not neglect them. Those who were not male citizens were, of course, not without religion. Let us begin, however, with the normative home, the word for which in Greek is oikos, and which we can translate better as household, and includes the extended meanings of homestead and family enterprise. It is telling that the Latin word equivalent to the Greek word oikos is familia, from which we derive the word family. Ancient Mediterraneans did not live in nuclear families, however, but rather as extended families that included not only children and parents, but also frequently daughters-in-law, grandchildren and slaves in their dual role as property and people, and animals as well as a property with a boundary and a structure, the house itself, that provided shelter. I mentioned last time Zeus Herkaios, who protected the area occupied by the property, and Zeus Ctesios, who safeguarded the family storehouse. These Zeuses, who share a name with the Olympian, may well derive from earlier gods and other gods altogether. But whatever the origin of their conflation, they do represent an identification in the minds of those who adopted the nomenclature. And again, I am thus inclined to pursue the links. You will recall the great Zeus of Olympus from our last lecture. It is interesting to compare these humble domestic Zeuses. Zeus Ctesius lived in a jar. 
The late 4th or early 3rd century BCE historian Anticlides instructs us how to prepare such a Zeus. The lid must be put on a new kadiskos, or jar, with two handles, and the handles crowned with white wool, and you must put into it whatever you chance to find, and pour in ambrosia. Ambrosia is pure water, olive oil, and all sorts of seeds, pancarpa. Pour in these. This Zeus, too, has a home and his own ambrosia. But this Zeus did not dwell alone. There were other gods in the house. Let us pay them a visit and look at their accommodations. Ancient Greek houses were typically built around a central open courtyard and were one to two stories tall. Before we turn into the entrance, we may take leave of Hermes of the road, Hermes Hodios. Such statues were found in the road and consisted of a rectangular block of stone with a head at the top, and about halfway down the block were male genitals. The phallus features prominently in Greek religion and will reappear in Roman religion too. As we face the house, to the right of the entrance is a shrine for Apollo Aguius, Apollo of the Aguii, which is to say Apollo on the street. Upon entry through the narrow hallway, just beyond the front door and to the right, we encounter a shrine for Hermes Strophios, literally twisting Hermes, so Hermes of the door hinge. There is a room to the right as well for a human doorman, so gods and humans cooperate here to protect the entrance. Upon completing our journey through the front hallway, we enter a peristyle courtyard, that is a courtyard surrounded by columns and open to the sky. Light and shadow change with the hour, and in the center of the courtyard we find an altar to our old friend Zeus Herkaios, so Zeus of the enclosure, suitably enclosed in the interior space of the house. We may note, too, that this front part of the house is reserved for men. This is the courtyard of the Androne, of the men. The back of the house is where the women would stay and engage in domestic work. This is the Gynaikeion. Women have a courtyard of their own. Women in Greece, at least upper-class women, were sequestered, although the example of a house that we describe here is larger than many would have been able to afford. Religious duties, especially duties on behalf of the community, were among the activities that permitted women to leave the house, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's return to the courtyard of the Androne and proceed through it past the altar of Zeus Herkaios and beyond the far line of columns to the portico hallway. In this hallway, we find another two shrines. At the end of the hall to the left is an altar of Zeus Ctesios, whom we have met before, as well as the gods of acquired goods who share an epithet. They are the Theoi Ctesioi. At the end of the hallway to the right is an altar of the Theoi Petroi, the paternal gods, that is, the gods one inherits from one's father, the family's ancestral gods. Each family had its own religious traditions, which descended along the male line. Now that we have visited each end of this hall, we return to the middle and enter the room in the center of the house, the Androne proper, also known in reference to the houses of earlier periods, especially the Bronze Age, as the Megaron, or Big Room. This is the room where men gathered for dining, drinking, and talking. Symposion in Greek, or in the more familiar Latinized word we still use today, the Symposium. Plato's dialogue by that name portrays Socrates' philosophical discussion of the nature of love at a drinking party. In this room, we find another altar to Hestia, or goddess of the family hearth. When we proceed through this room, once again, toward the back, we enter the second courtyard, the courtyard of the women, or gynaikeion. From the center of the women's courtyard on the right, we find the kitchen and another shrine. From the center of the women's courtyard in the back corner on the right, we find the master bedroom and a shrine to the gods of marriage, the Theoi Gamelioi, thus rendering the marriage bed the site of sacred activity. Let us pause and connect this humble domestic sphere to Olympus. The goddess of sex and lust lives on Olympus, 
What was her name? Yes, Aphrodite. Sex, at least when confined to the marital bed, was sanctioned by more than one god and potentially inspired by one of the most powerful gods of all. This tour has covered the basics. From street to kitchen, we have encountered altars, shrines, and associated deities. Who served all these gods and how? The father of the house served as chief priest. He would have inherited the family gods from his father, and he would determine offerings for Zeus Ctesios as well as for the other gods, especially Hestia, goddess of the hearth, whose altar stood at the center of the house in domestic worship. Of all the Olympians, it is interesting to note that Hestia has the least developed mythology, but in her domestic guise stood at the center of domestic worship as the goddess of the home's hearth, while Zeus Ctesios lived in a jar. Standard forms of worship included food offerings placed on Hestia's altar, which were burned, as well as libations or drink offerings, which consisted of pouring out wine and, of course, greetings and prayers. These gods lived in the house and were members of the family as much as the animals, slaves, children, and relatives. Before we go into too much more detail, let us note that the father also had religious duties outside the home. He was obligated to maintain the family cemetery and to bring regular offerings to departed family members. The living were never to forget their obligations to the dead. He also had duties to his clan or extended family outside the house, as well as to the city. But rather than leave the house, let's bring in the rest of the family. The wife and mother of the household had no official duties inside the house that belonged strictly to her, so far as we are informed. Naturally, she would have participated in rites led by the patriarch, images on gravestones, as well as other monuments, depict women and other family members as participating in sacrifices. Sacrifices, of course, took place outdoors, so we know that women participated in such ceremonies outside the house, just as they would have participated in ceremonies inside the house. The religion women found inside their husbands' homes, however, was not the worship that they had grown up with. Each household had its own ancestral gods, passed down patrilineally from father to son. Daughters worshipped at their father's hearths until the day they were married. After that, a wife worshipped at her husband's hearth. New husbands were generally in their 30s. New wives in their mid-teens. Such marriages would frequently be illegal today. But such age disparities were the norm in the ancient Mediterranean, and this also had implications for the religious experience of women. The husband was a middle-aged man who continued with his ancestral religion in his original home. The woman, still in her adolescence, must leave her family and her family's gods and become the member of a new family. She does this when she is still young and impressionable. She arrives young, inexperienced, alone, and a stranger, so to speak, in an established extended family. Given the age disparity, the bride arrives almost more as a daughter than as a partner. And in fact, marriage placed the bride in a legally dependent role vis-a-vis -vis her husband. One imagines that the transition was not always easy. And a fragment of a tragedy by Sophocles, although he is a male author, gives voice to a plausible female lament in this regard. As soon as we arrive at adolescence and begin to think for ourselves, we are driven from our native gods, the gods of our fathers. Some of us to hospitable men, others to savages. Some to good homes, others to toxic houses. And then, after a single night has joined us, it's necessary to offer our public gratitude and appear as if all were well. One supposes that the bride's youth might at least have allowed her time eventually to recover, to adjust, and to become a member of the new family. There was no choice, after all. Marriage was arranged and obligatory, and the state was inclined to punish men who failed to fulfill their obligation to marry, 
by their mid-30s, and girls simply had to obey their fathers. I imagine that there were many fights as well, as perhaps at least some relatively happy marriages. Brides who survived childbirth would also, of course, mature into women. Yes, I did say, the ones who survived childbirth. Death in childbirth was frequent, and infant mortality was higher. Most children died before the age of five, and for this reason, to maintain a stable population, women had to bear many children, thus risking death from childbirth, which was a real and fearful danger. Is it surprising in this context that Greek religion promoted sex and fertility? The very purpose of marriage was, in fact, the production of legitimate children, that is, children born to legally married citizens, children whose paternity was certified. Family worship depended on blood descent through the father's line, and many religious and moral conceptions, as well as legal requirements, restricted female behavior to enforce this requirement. Marriage was religious, personal, not civil. It varied in Greece from city to city, as well as over time but may be outlined generally. An agreement is reached between two families, which includes an agreement on the amount of dowry the bride's father will provide. Sacrifices are made to the gods of marriage. Artemis and Hera were favorites in this regard. The bride takes a ritual bath in Athens with water from the sacred spring of Calaroe. This bath is followed by a feast at the bride's father's house, where she is unveiled before the groom during a rite called the anacalypteria, the uncovering. Guests give gifts to the bride and groom. At nightfall, there is a procession to the groom's house. The bride's mother carries torches, as do others. There is music, and there are shouts of makaris moi. They are blessed. Once she has arrived at her husband's home, the bride is welcomed with the same ceremony that welcomes new slaves to the religion of the household. Bride and groom proceed to the family hearth, and they are showered with nuts, dried fruit, and figs. Or more literally in Greek, nuts, dried fruit, and figs are poured down upon them. This is the katakismata. The marriage will be consummated in the master bedroom before an altar to the Theoi Gamelioi, that is, the gods of marriage. Outside, well-wishers sing marriage songs called epithalamia, of which there were two genres, one for the evening and one for the next morning. Sounds like fun. A wedding, however, as anyone who has been married will know, merely marks the beginning of a marriage. If the bride failed to produce heirs, this was reason enough for divorce. This is an alien world indeed. Modern society spends far more resources suppressing fertility, with benefits, of course, to the status of women as free and independent agents with control over their own bodies and thus destinies. Our goal here, however, is not to judge, but to understand. How did religion intersect with experience, expectations, and society more generally? It is worth noting here that women also played an important role in civic and state ceremonies. In a world where many women were confined to the house, such ceremonies represented an op opportunity to leave the home and participate in outside activities, sometimes in the exclusive company of other women, a topic that we will explore in subsequent lectures. For the present, let us turn briefly to other members of the household and then look at the entire household and the family's responsibilities more generally. In bringing the bride and future mother into the home, we have touched on the end of a daughter's residence. She was born, named, welcomed, loved. Gravestones attest to parental affection. But a daughter was merely a temporary lodger in her father's religion. She eventually left to join another family. She participated in family religious ceremonies, but did not enjoy a substantial role. On the other hand, there were community ceremonies in which she could participate along with her mother. In Aristophanes' Lysistrata, 
The chorus of women outlined the sorts of religious ceremonies that they participated in as children. When I turned seven, I helped weave a cloak for Athena. When I was ten, I ground grain for Artemis. And taking off my saffron robe, I played the bear at the Brauronia. And once upon a time, when I was still a beautiful girl, I carried a basket during the sacred procession, wearing a necklace of dried figs. Girls had roles, too, just not the same roles as sons. Sons were born into a family and remained religiously tied to that family. Unlike daughters, a son was entered into the local registry of the fratry, his father's brotherhood or clan, and the father attested to his son's legitimacy. At puberty, somewhere between 12 and 20, the boy was again presented to the fratry, and the father again vouched for the son's paternity. The son then began two years of public service called the ephibia, after which he could be registered in his father's deem or municipality, as well as in the city registry. From this point, the young man could participate in political assemblies, as well as hold office, and he was obligated to perform military service. A man's youth came to an end really only at age 30, after which he was supposed to marry. But even marriage would not release him from his family. The son remained a son, and he could not become head of household until his father died or voluntarily relinquished his paternal authority. The son, moreover, was obligated to care for his parents in their old age, and he inherited the obligation to maintain family religious traditions as well as the ancestral cemetery. Slaves participated in family rites to the extent permitted by the father, who was chief priest and head of the family religion. Slaves, like new brides, were welcomed at the family hearth with showers of nuts, figs, and dried fruit. Although, as slaves, they remained property, they lived and worked as human beings side by side with other family members. In physical appearance and dress, slaves were generally indistinguishable from citizens. This was a cause for complaint. We have an anonymous piece from someone we call the old oligarch who protests that, among the slaves at Athens, there is the greatest lack of discipline. You can't hit them there, and a slave will not stand aside for you in the street. And if it were customary in Athens for a free person to strike a slave, you would often hit an Athenian citizen by mistake on the assumption that he was a slave. For the people in Athens are no better dressed than the slaves, nor are they any better looking. Slaves lived in intimate proximity with the family and were legally part of the oikos, or family household. As such, they ate, slept, worked, and worshipped under the direction of the father. How degrading and inhumane the experience an individual slave had, thus derived not just from the institution itself, but also from the personalities of the father or householder. The lot of slaves and brides shared more than just a common shower of nuts, dried fruit, and figs. Let us return to this father of the household and look more closely at his religious obligations. Although he was the head of the household, he was not master of his fate. He, like everyone else, was born into a system not of his own making. Ancient Greece was famously more permissive in terms of male sexual desire than almost any other society prior to our own. Pederasty and homosexuality were, for example, not only tolerated, they were sometimes celebrated. Such celebrations did not relieve men, however, of the obligation to marry and produce legitimate heirs who would inherit the family religion and tend to the family cemetery. The dead always weighed on the living, and at every turn, ancient religion acknowledged the debt the living owed to the dead. We, on the other hand, live in a presentist society. We do not believe in ghosts, nor do we lead our lives by looking incessantly to the example of how our grandparents did things. We look to the future and its cutting edge. And yet, we too live among ghosts,
We use words that are thousands of years old, obey laws with legal traditions, stretching back centuries, and many worship gods with even more ancient pedigrees. We are not as free from tradition as we often like to imagine. And in, and in antiquity, people celebrated tradition as the one true key to religion, morality, and earthly success. The old ways were the best ways. Innovation could only make life worse. Traditional religion provided paradigms. And even the father, the head of the household, chief priest of his family rights, was hardly free. Not only was he obligated to care for his ancestral gods, he was obligated to care for his ancestors. And these ancestors were not entirely gone. Although we will take up death and burial later in this course, suffice it to say here that proper interment was an absolute necessity to ensure safe passage of the spirit of the deceased to a safe resting place, wherever and whatever that may have been. Lacking proper funeral rites, a soul became a malevolent ghost who could cause harm to the living. Ancestral spirits demanded their share of sustenance, too, in the shape of sacrifices, food offerings, and libations. And these could be offered only by a living male member of their own blood. Similarly, the ancestral gods could be worshipped properly only by a male member related to his ancestors by blood. Without the blood tie, the ceremonies were invalidated. If an adulterous wife introduced a bastard son into the family line, the religious ceremonies and care for ancestral spirits were polluted. They were rendered null and void. Hence the repeated public attestations of the son's paternity at birth, and again at puberty. Hence the jealous guardianship exercised by fathers and husbands over female sexuality. Fundamental aspects of family religion absolutely depended on the chastity of the daughter who becomes wife and mother. And in addition to all this religion, something we moderns might consider significantly more important than ceremonies in service to gods and ancestors. Property. Sons, certifiably legitimate sons, inherited the family property. And families did not want their property leaving the male line through female adultery. Promiscuous male sexuality so long as it did not interfere with the production of legitimate children in other men's marriages, was neither a moral nor a religious concern. On the other hand, female sexuality, at least the sexuality of upper-class free women from citizen families with substantial property, was, and it was hemmed in, on all sides. Slaves, of course, and foreigners live by different rules, but then outsiders usually do and they were certainly open game for predatory men. The rules varied by status. We are not extremely well informed about the domestic worship of individual families. They were, in fact, private, secret, and the possession of individual families. In this sense, they also provided a bulwark against intrusion by the state. The state had an interest in compelling marriage, but the family not only possessed a house and a social organization of its own, but also a religion of its own. Much of the subsequent history of the state, as we shall see, reveals a history of arrogating to itself the powers that once resided with the head of household. Not all religion, at this pre-Christian date, resided entirely within the family, but much of it did. How this power was taken away from fathers and families will be part of our story, too. In our next two lectures, however, we turn to how humans interact with gods. How do we feed them? How do we communicate with them? How, in short, does one begin to navigate among them in a world so full of gods? So, until the next time we meet, dear students of ancient religions and cult practices, may your studies, as well as your nights and days, be auspicious. <laughs>